I want to zoom back out from the ground and go up to the level of an institutional investor. Ole Sorenson is here with us today. He's the Chief of Strategy and Research of ATP, which is one of the Danish very large institutional investors in this space. The dialogue between the policy community and the investment community is so weak, I simply <coughs> do not get it. Kyle and Nick was on the ATF, the advisory group on climate finance set up by the General Secretary of the United Nations earlier this year to sort of, at the starting sort of chart this territory for us. I think that's a major achievement, but if you look at it from sort of a little greater distance, you could ask yourself, why did that happen in 2010? Why didn't it happen in 2005, 2002? I don't know. We need strong policy commitments. That will be the key message you will hear from any institutional investor around the world. We need, we need clear and sustainable long-term policy commitments. Because if we do not have this kind of commitment, institutional investors cannot do what they're supposed to do as investors. They cannot engage with the companies on their climate development or climate strategies. They cannot engage with companies on a discussion on how to go about climate risk and and uh, make use of climate opportunity. And it's very, very difficult for us to go into the kind of utility investments and other kind of public uh, type investments in developing countries that are related to climate change. You cannot pay your way out of your policies. You simply cannot do that. You may be able to do that, but it takes a lot of money. That may, it may actually be cheaper to get policies right than try to pay your way out of this. What's the future of carbon trade and carbon finance? You have to have confidence in where people are going. The European declaration for 20% reduction 1919 to 2020 is, I think, credible. I'd like it to be a bit more credible. I'd like it to be 30%. But these are the kinds of things that we have to look for in building that confidence. One is I don't think we will see the international agreement. It would be very good, we have actually a working group in the UK thinking about couldn't we as business community go ahead and simply shadow price carbon. Uh, Shell is doing that in some, uh, in, in some respects, at 25 is too low. But uh, so maybe even there, what I call about the coalitions of like-minded businesses, we should explore that. But yes, we need that carbon price, but we are not on a very good track at the moment. And you are living in the US, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the ideas are about the alternative uh, routes. Um, it's very important to people understand the risks, but if it's just frightening people, it's not going to get anywhere. Uh, the, those ideas have to be about what we can do and why it's a, attractive. And behind the ideas will be examples. It's the power of the example, I think, that will give us particularly something to express. The Industrial Revolution will be in large measure in agriculture. It will be everywhere. And we have to be able to show to people what's going on. University teachers like myself have a job to do. Particularly journalists have a job to do. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for calling for the Industrial Revolution. I believe it's highly welcome. We need it. But I'm missing one element. We do not only need an Industrial Revolution. We need a revolution in people's minds. We need people to accept the possibility that we go through another revolution. And there are elements in our society that need to support this process, I believe. We have come from a guilt and sin-oriented society, and the churches have played an, a tremendous role in this. And we need to be based on creativity. We need to employ the engagement of all the people that can participate in this revolution. And that is the majority. The main investment we have to do is not financial, I believe. It is human. How do you want to motivate humans to participate, to believe that this is a future-oriented process? Thank you. We cannot wait for governments to move on this. We are moving forward. We are going to invest $1 billion in countries around the world that have proactive environmental standards. Where are you investing and how are you going about it? Uh, we're announcing, uh, OPEC is announcing uh, today uh, as part of the U.S. government's uh, and the President Obama's commitments to Copenhagen and to Fast Start, um, an initiative that we hope will raise a billion dollars in new financing for uh, 
climate change related uh, investments in emerging markets. Um, and specifically, uh, next week on December 15th, we'll be doing a global call for proposals for equity funds interested in investing in in the sector climate change related finance, meaning all kinds of renewable energy, wind, solar, ther geothermal, waste energy, that's for you, um, as well as the infrastructure for other kinds of uh, natural resources like water, agriculture, uh, land, etc. OPIC itself will put in uh, at least 300, we hope more, a uh, million dollars uh, to support the equity funds that, that, that compete successfully in this. And um, we just, I mean, we think this is a very exciting thing. It will be the largest uh, commitment that OPIC has made in the sector to date. And it will be one of the largest initiatives that the U.S. government has put forth to support climate change mitigation in, in emerging markets to date, too. Social security reform. China, as you said, uh, doesn't overpromise, it overperforms. But I truly believe that with this leadership now 12-year plan, and the way you do it in other fora, I was involved when we created the G20 among finance ministers, but China very much understood that the systemic significance comes systemic responsibility, that China will also take the next step now beyond the admirable progress back home of leading internationally in its very wise and, and uh, long-term way. The world needs that, and China will look good. MRV, for example, I understand China is now more amenable because you will look much better than the Americans and others when these things are, are measured. I, again, as a, as a personal impression and it being close to the dialogue that takes place in the party and in China, I hope this next step will come, the next leadership change. I think we've shifted in the business community and the finance community, we talk about opportunity. We see the size of this you know, multi-trillion dollar market as, as Richard Branson talked about yesterday. But it's very difficult to frame the question of opportunity when you're talking of, and when you're talking in developing countries with people who feel that they have not been at the table, that they've had no stake in, in how they ended up where they are, and for whom this is a debate about existence. It's about the way in which their families are going to survive, and it's the way in which they can actually ha even have an aspiration for their kids and for their kids' kids. And so I think that uh, in the past, the language of risk was off-putting to business. Um, you know, the sort of public policy language didn't allow the private sector. The private sector has taken the debate, talked about opportunity, but now that opportunity sticks in the claw, really, a claw, really, of, of those who still feel that they're not, they're not really at the table and don't have a stake in the future. I think language gets in the way, and especially at the international level. And so it's, it's at the national level, it's at the community level where you start seeing people starting to build, you know, a shared vision of the future. For political leaders, then I think it's how do you imagine what the future looks like? And I think some of the work that actually happened before Copenhagen and after Copenhagen, helping political leaders imagine what a decarbonized economy looks like in their country in the next 20 years, that is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and that's the conversation then that has to take place between political leaders and people with the business community part of it. So again, it's gonna be a bottom-up story. You're not gonna get a shift in language and an idiom that expresses and embraces how this is everybody's shared right. That's not gonna happen at the international level. It's gonna be a bottom-up shift in language to represent the ethic that you, you talk about. Thank you, Rachel. Take a few minutes to basically make a bridge from accelerating capital through to making mass change with information and communication. Basically, there's three driving beliefs here, and we've heard them from the, pan the, the panels previously. It's a, a job too complex for governments alone. Businesses has to, have to act. It's the economic opportunity of our generation to sort this, and actually we need to dive into sectors in order to make, make the solutions real. So, it's not for governments alone. It's been, t it's been said that it's three souffles that have to rise together. Policy, capital and technology in order to make a working marketplace to solve this problem. Policy is a necessary but insufficient condition to get things done and, and technology is arguably not the bottleneck. So we have to focus on capital and moving capital in. Can we afford it? We've heard this before as well. We can't afford it. The climate wealth opportunity. There are, the left side of the cost curve basically shouldn't be there. This is, this is opportunities that make money on existing on, on existing situation, a price on carbon.